We are investing in a lot of new technologies. We've just run out, uh, rolling out uh, 3G Plus uh, in French West Indies, but also in Bermuda. We've just rolled out a WiMAX network. In Jamaica, we now have about 17% of the broadband market in about six months. Uh, so, you know, we're doing a lot of new things within our markets. We're buying ICT companies, but just bought one in, in uh, Papua New Guinea. We just bought one in the Caribbean. So we're, we're taking our customers and saying, what are the services we can provide? And, you know, how quickly can we do that using new technology? Obviously, a lot of people are familiar with cell phones in developed countries, but you're generally operating in places where people are living on a subsistence wages. What sort of difference does broadband or even cell phone capabilities have to people in these countries? Well, a massive difference, you know, because, you know, if you're a, uh, if you're a farmer up in, you know, up in a mountainside in, say, Haiti, for example, and you want to know when you should bring your produce to the market and which market to bring it to, they use their cell phone. They'll ring their friend down the mountain and say, how much are you know, mangoes being sold for this week in that market, and they might bring it to another market. Same for fishermen. So it is a major, major difference to their lives, but also from a health point of view, from keeping in touch with families, but it's a huge, big track for diaspora because mm -hmm. if somebody on a mountaintop can ring their son or daughter that works in New York driving a taxi and say, you know, can you send me money? Right. Contact equals more. Uh, you know, uh, remittances. I understand that Digicel has also brought to Pacific Islanders the ability to send money internationally, which is something most Americans don't have. I, how, how does that work? Because, you know, a lot of the islanders would go gravitate towards New Zealand primarily, but also to the west coast of America and into Australia as well. So, you know, most islanders would have spent some time in New Zealand, uh, particularly people who have second level or third level education. So we use that as a way of actually doing remittances back from New Zealand into, say, Samoa or Tonga or indeed Fiji. You've been involved in the Haiti Mobile Money Initiative with USAID, which is an aid group, and the Gates Foundation, Bill, Ga Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Philanthropy. Mm. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing there in Haiti? Well, great credit, first of all, to USAID for even coming with this initiative with the Gates Foundation. So, you know, they p gave us a time frame. They said to all the operators, you know, if you, you have to get 10,000 transactions and real transactions and customers registered on the service. And these um, are what sort of transactions? These would be small micro payments between people, like two, three dollars or less. So it's mobile money. It really is mobile money mm -hmm. in a purer sense. So they said, okay, there's a prize of two and a half million dollars. And the prize could have been a hundred thousand dollars, but you'd want to go and win it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our team, our country team, uh, our management team down there said, we want to go and win it. And at first I was kind of skeptical, how do you get all these pieces of the jigsaw, put them all together and create this service, plus get real transactions? And they were able to do it, which uh, was a great credit to them. As you know, in much of uh, the rest of the world, the Haiti uh, earthquake was massive news, but it has really sort of fallen off the pages of the newspapers. How do you get people in the developed uh, world now to show interest in the redevelopment of Haiti? Well, well, uh, there's two things here. Is first of all, President Clinton is such a proponent and such a, an incredibly forceful figure in trying to keep Haiti on the agenda, both in the United States and in internationally. And he's doing that usually successful. And he is actually one of the great hopes for Haiti because he is co-chairing the Reconstruction Commission with the Prime Minister of Haiti and you making sure that the donor's money actually flows. You know, in the doning world, you know, people make promises and they don't keep those commitments. And uh, what President Clinton is doing with the international community is making them keep their commitments. Then within the Clinton Global Initiative, which I'm working for, uh, we then have donors that have said, okay, in a private or NGOs or people here in the United States, philanthropic people, said we're going to commit money and we're involved on, a, on every two months having a meeting going through everybody's promises and making sure they commit them and monitoring all the different projects so that you know, people actually deliver what they're saying. So for other philanthropists, what sort of advice do you have beyond just giving money to causes? Well, I, I think, you know, you've got to enjoy giving money away in the first instance. And, and if you can see that your money is being used in a, in a very uh, catalytic way to change the way things are happening, you know, either building a school 
or helping special needs children you know it, it could be anything really but you've got to go and enjoy it and, and yesterday you know I was with some ph uh, philanthropists that came down from the United States with me to Haiti mm -hmm. and they went and saw all these projects and they came away and said God we love this because we can see where our money is going so you've talked in the past about responsible capitalism, uh, which is, I guess, the commercial side of what you do. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I, I don't, you know, I'm, I must say I'm not very keen on the term corporate social responsibility. I think it's naff, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that if you, you know, make a large-scale investment in a poor country, well, then in parallel you have to do, you know, serious, well-thought-out uh, social funding of projects. Mm -hmm. And even in countries where, you know, before we even went into Haiti, we were involved in a number of different projects through an NGO called Concern Worldwide, mm -hmm. terrific organization. And we funded them because we wanted to learn more about the people mm -hmm. of Haiti before we launched our operations. You also have uh, Philanthropy Frontline, which I understand is trying to help activists stay out of jail. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering if you've different. been involved in the Middle East at all lately. Well, a lot of, you know, Frontline's clients, if you call them that, but human rights defenders are very much centrally involved in, in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. You know, particularly very repressive regimes, uh, Egypt, and it's still repressive, Tunisia, still repressive. Mm -hmm. So we would have a lot of, of our human rights activists that we help, we fund, we move them out of countries when they're in peril. Mm -hmm. We may send people to actually live with them because you know an international person working with a human rights activist would, would necessarily then the government would be afraid to move on them. We're working in Africa, a lot of issues in Africa, in, uh, in, uh, also in South America as well.